All right. Hey there, folks. Even though convention signings and other live events are getting back on track, I figured I'd keep bringing book tour to you. So welcome to Russ's Rock and Roller Coaster, intriguing interviews with creative minds. So I've actually wanted to do this panel for years. So I admit I'm a little extra giddy tonight. So vigilantes and antiheroes are a staple of crime and horror fiction, but blood spatter analyst by day, serial killer by night. I don't think we've ever encountered a character quite like this one before. Based on the books by Jeff Lindsay, the series ran for nine seasons, some of them great, some of them a little bit less so, but centered on a complex character and a body count that went up into the hundreds, which is why tonight we'll be covering the kill room in plastic so we can get on with deconstructing Dexter. On our panel tonight is New York Times multiple best-selling, uh, New York Times best-selling and multiple Bram Stoker award-winning author Nancy Holder. Nancy has written and edited dozens of novels and book projects, hundreds of short stories, essays, comic books, and online games, and worked on such properties as Sherlock Holmes, Zorro, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Wonder Woman, Crimson Peak, Kolchak, The Night Stalker, Green Hornet, Hellboy, and more. Welcome back, Nancy. Thank you, Russ. All right. Also on our panel tonight is Bram Stoker Award-winning author Tom Didi. Didi? Daddy? Didi? Didi. 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 There you go. Tom has written several novels, novellas, a short story collection, and the first book in his middle, and his first book in his middle grade horror series. Welcome, Tom. Thanks for having me. All right. And rounding out our panel is Dharma Keller, who writes gritty crime thrillers about queer women who kick ass and take names. Dharma is one of the most prolific, openly transgender authors in the crime fiction genre, whose action driven thrillers explore the complexities of social and criminal justice in a world where their legal system favors the privileged. And we're going to touch on that at the very end. All right. Welcome, Dharma. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be part of the group. All right. So just a heads up to the folks at home. Feel free to send notes or questions you have for me or the panel in the chat box during the show, and we'll get to a few at the end. So let's talk about Dexter. And I think, as you guys can see, I've got my Dexter behind me. I got my Dexter shirt and I've also got my Dexter mug. So I'm all Dextered up. All right. So I've read the first three novels and I've watched the entire run of the series several times. And every time I watch it, I feel like in some ways I'm watching it for the first time. Uh, there's a lot more to Dexter than meets the eye. Uh, we don't have time to do a full deep dive on all nine seasons, but given the, the scope and evolution of the series, much like Dexter himself, we'll be cutting him up into parts. So for now, we're going to focus only on seasons one through four. That's how we're starting the show. All right. So... Dexter's clearly great at his day job and also at his night job. And then the ice truck killer shows up and boy, does he ever want to play. So what did you think about Dexter? Now, this is remember, go back to the beginning. What did you think about Dexter when you first met him? Nancy, what'd you think? Well, it's interesting you should ask me that, Russ, because in the afternoon, while I was trying to remember how many hours difference it was between Washington <laughs> State and you, um, I watched the first episode again. And so I had a brand new introduction to Dexter, and I was surprised at how much happened in the first episode. I didn't remember it that way. I think I was so mesmerized by the character the first time I watched it that I wasn't really parsing all the different things that were happening so quickly. But there's a tremendous amount of stuff crammed into that first episode, and I, I really had not remembered it. I thought the ice road thing kind of came like the third episode or so. And so I was very surprised when I did a rewatch. I did a rewatch last year, and then I watched the first episode again today, and it was just a ton of stuff happens. But he's also extremely charismatic. Um, mm -hmm. Luerta likes him, and uh, De even Deb is kind of sparkly around him. People, Rita wants to sleep with him, finally. People like him. And uh, there's something about that I want to talk about later if you hit it, but it's that you're set up to like him. That's right. So. So Dharma, what'd you think? So um, we're talking about initial impressions. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard. I mean, I, I started rewatching the series um, about a month or so ago, just to refresh my memory. As far as my initial take, I I, I liked him. I mean, uh, I I think I, one of the things I really liked is that it's very, he's very different. He's not just, it's not just the usual police procedural or private investigator. This is, He's a psychopath or sociopath, but he's got a code and uh, he's trying to pretend to be human. And uh, I've, I've read uh, several of the books as well. So sometimes I kind of 
confused because the books are somewhat different. They are. He's a little bit different character in in the books, yep. but um, uh, I just I liked that this was a very different type of character. Uh, he wasn't like a, a Sherlock Holmes ripoff, like you see in like The Mentalist or The Closer or the you know the the quirky consulting kind of thing. So okay. it was just a very refreshing type of character. So Tom, give me just again initial impressions of Dexter. Yeah, similar to what everyone's already said. I liked him. I liked the character. Uh, I liked how I went in uh, obviously a little late to the party, so I knew who and what Dexter was. So I wasn't sure how he would be portrayed, but I, I love the character and I love the way he fits in for the most part, other than when somebody like Dokes, he sets <laughs> off something in Dokes, which is a hilarious. We're, we're going to get, we're going to get to that for sure. Yeah. Right? But yeah, I, I liked him. I liked the way he was able to portray himself and make himself fit into, um, you know, regular society, have a job and not have everybody looking at him funny. All right. So, so we we're introduced to this character, right? You know, tonight's the night, right? He's and he's and he's and he's he's always he's always on the hunt. He's always on the prowl, and yet, you know, if you scrape away the charisma, and let's just say he wasn't charming, but everything else was the same, there's no possible way we would see him in the same. We would think this guy is a fucking slut. This guy is insane. This guy is completely unhinged. He is a wild animal who you can't have this guy walk in the streets. But, you know, just like Tony Soprano or, you know, Walter White or, you know, pick your any hero who do, do some really gruesome things. You know, I mean, and even the what he does is, you know, we'll talk a little bit about our justifications for what we allow for so we are introduced to him and he's got this little ecosystem of, of people right he's got you know he's got this mostly it's the station crew and he's got rita and he's got and he's got deb and he's got harry so you've got harry on one side of him and you got Deb on the other. I'm talking, this is er, 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 for season one, early season, right? We're just kind of getting to know him. And then he's got his, you know, his, his worker friends over here. You know, whether they're actually, whether he considers them friends is a kind of a separate thing, but they're the people in his ecosystem. So talk to me a little bit about the dichotomy between having Harry, ghost Harry, you know, talking to him, guiding him, the code, the rules to do some really horrible things. And then Deb, who's just so eager, she's eager and nervous and twitchy and trying to, you know, just worships Dexter in so many ways. Talk to me about the, the, the interaction between of Dexter with these two family members on either side of him and what you think it did or didn't do for the character. So Tom, just give, give me some thoughts. Yeah, so early on in the in the season or the series, I liked what Harry had done for Dexter in, in order to kind of, you know, keep him safe, keep him out of jail, keep him from getting killed by giving him the code. I thought it was a good way to channel his urges his dark passenger as he calls it that opinion changed fairly quickly but um i thought him on one side it's kind of like the angel devil thing and as it turns out harry was really the devil and deb was the angel trying to well we're, we're gonna we're gonna talk more about that but okay, okay. but uh, um, yeah De deb's i wish deb had more influence on him because she really came close to getting him closer to human as the series went on but he always had harry in his head with the code Okay, Nancy, what do you think? Well, I I agree with you, Tom. Um, what I what I found sort of moving is he says in the first episode, um, that's Deb, my foster sister. She's the only person who loves me. And then he says, if I could have feelings for anybody, I would have them for Deb. And so um, you know, it's so weird that he knows that he's not feeling things, but he can figure out what it should be that he feels. And I think that Harry, um, well, as we'll find out later, all the twistedness of that relationship mm -hmm. comes to the fore. But in the beginning, 
when he's, you know, there, he's a teenager and he said, I found your knives are covered with blood, um, that he really does have this dichotomy, but Deb is like the light. If only he could have, like Tom is so right, if only he could have stayed on the side of the angels, maybe it would have come out differently. But Harry is such a presence in seasons one through eight that, you know, it's hard to, that's, that's a hard thing to, to. Yes. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to talk okay. yeah. father. We're going to talk about fathers and sons a little later. So, okay. so Dharma, Dar what, what, what about you? You know, again, we're talking at the early stages. Talk to me about, you know, those two different voices kind of in his head. Yeah. I, 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 one of the things that really struck me early on, especially is how, you know, I mean, Deborah, she wants to move up in the, the Miami PD and she just keeps asking Dexter for tips and clues and like uh, help, his help to solve these cases so that she gets the credit. And that's, that kind of struck me kind of odd. Although I, she, she certainly definitely wants him to succeed in whatever, uh, you know, she wants him to have a, a normal life and um, they have a really good relationship, um, even though it's kind of a, a different kind of relationship you know she's she's foul mouth she's always punching him <laughs> it's like hey straighten up and fly right and all this stuff mm -hmm. and and yet at the same time you know there's there's the ghost of harry in his code and whatever his motives may have been revealed later at least it without that code i think he wouldn't have gotten to that point where he is so that's right i mean uh, so this is just my take on it and i know having read several of the books and i've seen the show many times i do not believe that dexter didn't actually love his sister i actually don't believe that i think okay. he did i think it was buried mm -hmm. beneath a lot of programming and you know trauma, trauma. but yeah. you know to say that he, he didn't have any feelings uh, that's just I, his his actions betray those sentiments because if he really didn't care for her, there's only so much acting any person can do. At a certain point, your instincts take over. I I never bought his. I don't. Ha, I don't love her. He did. I. Th I. That's just my opinion. I. He may not have known how to express it or to show it, but I think he did the best he could given what he was sort of taught to be. All right. So, so the ice truck killer and and one of the things I want to talk about here, and we're going to do this throughout the 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 hour is that thematically, at least in season one, it was really Dexter's origin story, mm -hmm. but it was about brotherhood and family. Mm -hmm. He learns, we, he, and we, we learn as he learns, which was part of the brilliance, I think, of the first season, is that, you know, the intro, first there's the ice truck killer and how bizarre that was, right? The gamesmanship. We got to see Dexter kind of doing his separate, his, you know, his side missions, you know, take, you know, doing his kill of the week and whatnot and watching his um, ritual and, and having that real intimacy there. But the sense that Dexter had an actual brother and that he wound up having to make a very difficult decision about how to handle that at the end, because we see the difference is that, you know, was it, I guess my question for you is this. Let's just say that Brian, Biney, Biney, had, had been given the code. Does that mean that he would have ended up a quasi-Dexter? Or are we talking about two completely different animals here? Tom, what do you think? Yeah, I. can you hear me? Sorry about that. I yeah, I think um, I think you used the operative word a, a few minutes ago in programming. I think that's exactly what Harry did to Dexter. And I think if he had had the same opportunity with Dexter's brother, I think they would have ended up very similar people and he would have been influenced at that young age to follow the code. Hmm. What, what about Dharma? What do you think? I, I think so, too. I think you know, of course, uh, Brian was a little bit older than Dexter was when their mother was killed. So that may have changed his trajectory as well. Um, so that um, maybe he would have been, had the code, but how close he would have followed it, I don't know. So, so, so Nancy, I'm, 
my belief, no. I think there's no, no. possible way. No. I think <laughs> I think what makes Dexter the character so magical is that it had to be exactly the right, you know, for him to turn out the way he did and for us to sort of fall in love with him in a way, it had to be the exact right elements in the cocktail to make that particular witch's brew. And if my that's just my take on it. And if any of the elements had been different, it would have been a train wreck. And I think Brian just didn't have that inner spark, that inner magic that would have essentially allowed him to be a Dexter type. I don't know. That Nancy, what do you think? You agree, disagree? I, I definitely agree with you. And um Harry says he was too old and he was too messed up. And somehow he knew, and I agree with that because I'm I'm a dog person and you can see yep. a bunch of dogs and you can say, you yep. know what, there's something wrong with that dog. Yep. And you could train it and you could hope, but sometimes it's just not yep. going to work. I and agree. I, I agree. All right. So season two um, was critical in my mind for three reasons. One, it really amped up the Dokes Dexter manhunt. We'll talk about that a little bit. We got to see how Dexter's other life affected Rita and her kids. So his actions had real world repercussions. And three, it introduced Lila and more significantly to me, I think, the idea that Dexter's dark pack passenger is really an addiction. What do you guys think? Dharma, talk, talk to me. I don't know. I mean, I'm a recovering addict myself, a recovering alcoholic. And I don't know if it's a, I mean, it can certainly feel like when I was in the throes of my alcoholism, yeah, it felt like like an irresistible force. So I don't know. I wouldn't have classified it as an addiction, maybe a compulsion, but not an addiction. Mm -hmm. All right, Tom, what, what do you think about any of the things I've just said here? Yeah, I, I am actually opposite of that, Dharma. I think it was an addiction, and I think the one good thing that the new blood season did was show that okay well, hey, 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 okay <laughs> sorry sorry, sorry. Yeah, don't jump um, in yes it. i don't jump in okay it. i do think it's an addiction and i do i like the way they used his cover as being a drug addict mm -hmm. as kind of a parallel to that that he could consider his affliction, just like other people consider their, you know, their drug addictions or alcohol addiction. So I do think it was an, a, an addiction. And I just think, again, the programming that Harry had put in him did not allow him to see it that way. So, so Nancy, let, let's, let's, let's just switch over. I want to switch over to the dokes to dokes for a minute. <laughs> so, because if you think about the, the way that the series is structured, you know, we had a certain thrill in watching Dexter go be Dexter. I mean, essentially, he's just, he's maybe a nudge or two past Batman, right? I mean, right, he's a vigilante who goes out. He has a very strict code. He only goes after certain people. He's not just randomly snatching people off the streets. He vets them. He's careful. He And, you know, there's no, there's no love lost for the people that he takes out. And we got to see that. But right. folks, man, whew, he <laughs> sniffed that out from day one. He knew, he knew, and he was right, but he knew. What do you think the Dexter saga, at least in those, I mean, really, it'll really carry through all the way to the end, really. But talk to me about what Dokes brought to the table and how it altered the way that we viewed Dexter because of Dokes. I have a I have two ways of looking at it. One way is as a writer. And the problem with being a writer is that you look behind the curtain all the time. So my husband and I were sitting there watching the show and Doug showed up and we went, antagonist, impediment. And so from a mechanical <laughs> view, we had to have jokes. Right. Um, but, and it seemed a little weird that he was so incredibly hostile towards him right off the bat. It was like a, a little much. Um, so I, I question why is this guy so pissed off that 
there's something weird about Dexter. Why does it infuriate him so much? And so, so I kind of kept watching him, but I also knew he was there to be a problem because I'm a writer. So I had to pretend I didn't know that so I could enjoy the show. Um, but I kept thinking, why is he so bombastic about this whole thing? And that made him more interesting. Mm. And that made him more menacing towards Dexter. And it made me more protective towards Dexter. Right. So I'm really yes, about- yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank yeah. you. That's it. Gold store. That was that was what I was reaching for. We were, you know, so uh, actually, let me, uh, you don't want to hear. You guys don't want to hear from me. I want to hear from you guys. So Dharma, what, what do you think? Do you do you do you buy into that theory that? You know, because because Dokes was the attack dog that we sort of instinctively wanted to protect Dexter from 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 the big angry man. Absolutely. I I think, you know, one of the reasons I think Dokes was so antagonistic towards Dexter is because, as they pointed out in in that season, is that they were a lot alike. Mm. They were both monsters. Yes. And um, they both were really good at hiding they're being monsters, yeah. but just kind of in a different way. They're like, one's a wolf and one's a tiger or something. So they're both predators, but they're just kind of different predators. And so they kind of get in under each other's skin. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's to me, it's such a shame that they, he had to go early, but you know, I think it's, it's fair to you know the, the producer was saying, look, you know, how, how many seasons can we go when this guy is up his ass until they have it, they're going to have to have a showdown eventually. It's going to have to happen, but in any, exactly. yes. All right. So, Season three, I thought, I don't want to go too deep onto it, but I did want to, I thought was interesting is that it explored the idea of whether Dexter could have a real friend who understood his life behind the mask. And then, of course, in season four, Dexter explored the idea of whether he could really balance his dark passenger life with being a family man. Mm -hmm. So he was exploring his and that's why I never believed that he was a true, you know, psychopath, sociopath, because true psychopaths and sociopaths don't try to explore their inner humanity. They don't at least try. And Dexter did, whether he succeeded or not is a, is a separate issue, but he tried. So talk to me about kind of those two elements of trying to have a friend and then trying to decide if can I make this work being can I have it all? basically, right? Because Harry kept telling him, you're going to have to choose. So talk to me about trying to have a friend and then talk to me about trying, and what, can he have a dark passenger and a friend? And can he have a family, a dark passenger and a family? So Nancy, what do you think? Talk to me about, about those thematically. Talk to me about that. Well, there's a lot of tropes, a lot of TV shows where the the diligent worker, the we're watching um, Mystery Road, which is an Italian uh, Australian show, where the the crime fighting dude has to be alone. You have to be alone if you have a passion and if you want justice. And in his own twisted way, uh, Dexter wants justice. Um, and there are a lot of shows where um, it's all fun and games until you have kids. And I'm thinking of the Americans. If you ever yes. watched oh, Americans. brilliant show. Brilliant. Everything is cool until you realize I have to go get milk and buy the diapers, but I have to kill this guy. <laughs> so so could he have a normal life because he's Dexter? Or could he have a normal life because of what he does as Dexter or a kind of almost the same? But but his attempt to, I mean, he was kind of stuck. She got pregnant. And he, she's going to have his baby. She really is. So it's not like he said, well, I'll date someone and then I'll try to marry her and then I'll have a ch- uh, have children. It happened a little bit out of sequence. So in a way, the choices were taken away. And so I think he was fumbling through to do the best he could, which is one of the reasons we find him so relatable is we too are fumbling through the best we well, can. The thing is, I'll disagree a little bit because you say he didn't have a choice, but no, he did have a choice. That's just it. He he could have said, fuck it. I'm out of here. This ain't this ain't working. And a, soci- a true psychopath would have either done that or would have disposed of the problem himself. But he endeavored to make yeah. it work. I'm not saying it was the right choice or the best choice, but he really, he remember at one point they said, you know, I think he was arguing with Harry and he said, you know, his fake cover, it's not a fake cover life for me anymore. This is, this is my life. 
Yeah, yeah you're right. sort of like he he discovered parts of himself that he a not only did not think were there, but was told could never be there, and he accepted that as gospel, right? And he's starting to realize I want you know in a way he's almost like a teenager, right? You can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me what to think. I'm my own person. I know what I'm doing, right? But of course, you know, <laughs> he doesn't. But all right, so he's trying to balance, you know, the family and the friends, but look what happens inadvertently. Like LaGuerta's friend, the, the lawyer is killed because he teaches Jimmy Smith what to do, right? She gets killed. Obviously, we know what happened with Rita, horrible, which traumatized forever the children, but also in season two, remember, Lila kidnapped them and tried to burn them alive. I mean, his actions had very, very real consequences, and yet we still love the guy. <laughs> what kind of spell does this guy cast over us where he can consistently put good people in horrible situations and we go, you know, what are you going to do? It's just Dexter being Dexter. Um, so, all right, so we know that, you know, obviously um, his exploration of a family life did not go well. And I, you know, I can never stop unsee that scene, you know, in, uh, in season four, when, uh, when, what's his name, Jonah, he smashes the, the windshield with a bat, right? And then Dexter comes over to kind of protect him. And then, you know, and Trinity grabs his finger and he snaps it right there. And he's just going to bite down and keep it all in this and to see, talk to me about your thoughts about watching Dexter see what a real, what a really unhinged monster is like. Because he always said, oh, I'm a very neat monster, but I'm a monster. But there are monsters and there are monsters. Talk to me about the difference. Dharma, what do you think? Yeah, I think in that context, Dexter is more of a predator, but uh, uh, John Lithgow's character was a true monster. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I think that that scene at the end of season four, where he's in the tub with uh, and doing the killing, boy, that was just like absolutely chilling. I've never seen. I mean, I, I've always loved John Lithgow as an actor, but that that was like really, really, truly quite a, a performance. Um, he's because he's a natural ham, and he was not exactly. He, he was not. Oh yeah, this was like total chill, ice in the veins killer. Right. Yeah. And yes, all right. So um, we could talk about Trinity all night, and I would love to, but we're running out of time, and we have a okay. lot more to go through. All right, so seasons five through eight were a bit of a shift. Yes, we know seasons six and eight in particular were, in my mind, pretty lousy, and we'll get to those in a minute. But real quick, season five we started with Dexter in free fall after Rita's death. And I think they got off to a pretty good start with him, but then he seemed to me to get over his grief way too fast. And I was sort of hoping that we would have gotten maybe either like a ghost Rita or multiple flashbacks throughout the season so we could watch uh, her death haunt him for kind of a long time, because that to me would have really demonstrated how much humanity was really in there. I mean, I know it was there, but I think that really... Would have shown that what so what do you what do you think you know what did you think about um the impact of dexter losing his wife and then really you know seasons one through four were sort of like we'll call it like the magic years for him and then after that was kind of it was like the rise and the fall right that was kind of rita's death was like we got to see the the rock band forming and then they you know they played the garden and then the drug you know it's like then in the drugs and the fighting broke them all up so so what do you think dharma what do you think about the, the that domino falling and kind of you no know, it kind of it kind of reminds me of uh the the st structure the series structure of breaking bad mm. Where you see, okay, <laughs> oh, away, he's yes. becoming, he's overcoming all his challenges and everything, and then suddenly he becomes this dark force and embraces that dark. That's when he when he let what's her name Jane die there on the bed. Exactly, yep. exactly. So in the case of Dexter, yeah, I mean, uh, we we get to see him with uh, Lumen. Lumen, yep. Yeah, and um, it was 
I don't know. I, I kind of, I still like that season. Yeah, I think it would have been good to see how the trauma of losing Rita affected him. But, uh, and I think we kind of get to see a hint of that in the trauma of Harrison. Mm. Yes. Um, so you know, he begins to wonder yeah. if Harrison is going to be like him, no. if he needs to teach him the code. Well, and yeah. um, so I, I think thought, I thought really it was interesting kind of very of early on. I can't remember. It was maybe episode two or three of that season where, you know, at the beginning, he's kind of just kind of like he's sort of in shock. Mm -hmm. And then he loses it, right? He went to that. I don't remember where he was. He was a gas station, bathroom, whatever. And that guy was like, I don't, you know, fuck you and your dead wife. And he just fucking oh, yeah. all hammer and just, be you know, and then Harry said, that's the first human thing you've done. Mm, right. Yeah, I, 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 that, right. that, and he was like on the floor howling like a wild animal. Right. So mm -hmm. much pain. Now you can't tell me that someone who, that if he didn't have love in his heart for that woman, that he would respond that way. There's no possible way he would do that. Sure. He'd just be like, oh, well, you know, obstacle removed. What are you going to do? <laughs> I just want, I wanted to see that inner, just that anguish be spread out longer because I felt like it was almost too cathartic. And after that, he was sort of like, yeah, you know, it sucks, but what are you going to do? But anyway, um, all right. Now, season six, I thought it wasn't, close to my being my favorite season but i thought it was interesting thematically which was can dexter have a spiritual side not really a place you would think that a character like dexter would go but they tackled it and i thought it was sort of interesting and i was into it with brother sam who kind of really challenged dexter con to consider is there is there or is there not a higher power at work whatever you want to call it and Dexter was, you know, very skeptical at first, but then he kind of was like, well, I don't, you know, he considered it. And that to me is what I found endlessly fascinating about Dexter is that whether he bought into the idea ultimately or not, he was willing to accept the possibility that there was more to him and more to his existence than he was initially told. But then Brother Sam got taken out, I thought, a little too early. And then the rest of the season was about Wormwood. Now, but stick with me about this point. What did you think about, just specifically, about the idea of exploring, of Dexter exploring God or a higher power? So, Dharma, what do you think? So, you're, you've been in recovery. I, I thought it was, it was kind of interesting, and especially the, the way, you know, uh, Brother Sam wasn't like, oh, you have to believe in, you know, but he was more of the spiritual, less so of the religious. And um, it was interesting how the it, in some of the books kind of explored a little bit of that too, even going so much as, into the the paranormal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, um, so here we ahead. right. So then, so the season was you know the season was the season you know the oh he's dead all along that that didn't really fly too yeah. well. Uh, well, too bad because you know Edward James almost is such a is such a commanding presence, but I felt he was you know. It was a it was a goofy it was a goofy decision and it was regrettable. But anyway, but here's what I want to talk about. The season was the season, and then we had the moment. We had the moment. Deb catches Dexter literally in the um, act. Now that is what I want to talk about. So, Tom, you're sitting there shaking your head. Talk to me. I, I honestly thought you were going to say the moment was something else because, in my opinion, after watching this for the second time, episode 11 is where Fonzie starts waxing the skis to get ready to jump the shark because <laughs> Deb, all of a sudden, thinking she's in love with Dexter, was the worst Okay. Agreed. A plot, oh, yeah. writing, whatever awful. you want to call it. Awful. Um, awful. I, I agree. I hated it. But mm -hmm. but that moment is a moment I never thought was going to come in the series, the one you just mentioned, when she catches him red-handed mm -hmm. um, performing the ritual. I never thought that would happen. It took me completely by surprise. But not only that, so but what it does is that, set, that was the domino that that sets us off to the end and which we'll get later but i just talked to me about them because i get to look the season was the, the edward james almost his character not his fault but it was just stupid but i didn't there were some i thought there was some interesting things about the season but that moment 
I remember, and I've seen it three times, and every time, it just gives me chills. So, Nancy, talk to me. I mean, we're talking about the moment. Okay. Talk to me um, about that moment. The, that moment, first of all, I completely agree that the Deb and Love and the the whole Edward James almost thing was whacked. I, we kept thinking, have they, it, what happened to Dexter? This is just so weird. It was like, well, it's been weird, so we'll make it weirder. How could we make that even weirder? So it was like weird city. And um, so I was detaching a little, starting to sit back when I'm watching like, okay, this is getting really weird. So as soon as that happened, I went like, oh my God. And I moved forward. So I was back connected back in the Dexter moment because that's what Dexter was about. It wasn't about these weird angels and all this jazz and right. Deb being in love with them. He was the serial killer who was constantly in danger of getting busted. And he got busted by the person who was the closest person in his life. Yeah. To him. Right. I mean, it wasn't that someone busted him. It was that Deb. Bust. I mean, that's yeah. that moment was kind of set up really in season five. They were there and they kind of, they wussed out a little bit. Yeah. But, but that moment I just thought was just brilliantly captured. And that sets us off. And then starting from there, in my mind, Dexter is a completely different character from that moment going forward. Because up until then, Deb has worshipped Dexter in every possible way. She loves him and, you know, she counts on him. You're the only person who's there for me. I love you. And, da, da, da. and then whole, I mean, talk about what this guy has done to this poor girl. Mm -hmm. And then she has to live with what this is and how she carries that. And then Dexter meets Hannah. <laughs> and she's the, you know, we got some of this with Lumen where she mm. was like, okay, I get what you are. I don't judge you. She was in her place. But then she realized I needed to get that out of my system. It's out of me. Hannah, very different animal. Not exactly Dexter, but not, not Dexter either. And those various elements combined brought us to the critical, the this, this, this second, in my mind, moment, which is the finale of season seven, in, mm -hmm. once again, in a shipping container. And Deb is, Paul, is put, is faced with, there's no really good choice Mm -mm. did she make the right one nancy oh man put me on the <laughs> and she says, you're a good cop put him down put him down and i guess see my dog analysis has carried through my discussion um and then she shoots la Guerta, like holy excuse me we could we can swear <laughs> holy fucking shit um i i did not expect that i well i didn't know what the hell i expected but um I didn't pick up that she had the gun at first. And so when she shot La Guerta, I was like, what? And then more than that, the shock took over. Did she make the right decision? She loved Dexter. She, I mean, she didn't, I don't think she loved him romantically. I never bought that. But she was told that she did. And she was programmed by her therapist, the same as Dexter was programmed by Harry. So... um. <laughs> what a way to duck it. <laughs> you know, I don't know if don't she know made the right doing. decision for her, but but all right, all right. Tom, but you, you know, okay, maybe her career will survive this move. <laughs> Tom, what do, you, what, what do you think? Horrible choice. No, no good answers. No good. I mean, what do you think? As a viewer, in hindsight, knowing what we know, it was not the right choice, but right. at the time. I, I don't know. I think, like you said, there's no right or wrong choice, but I can see why she made that choice. Oh, I think there was definitely a right or wrong choice, but. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't see how it could have happened any other way because <sighs> she had this conflict with La, La Guerta uh, since day one. I yeah. mean, they've been butting heads and yeah. at each other's throats, uh, power struggle since day one. And and then on the other hand, she's got Dexter, who romantic feelings aside, she still loved him as a brother. Mm -hmm. And and she was conflicted about the fact that he was a serial killer. But I I don't see it happening any other way. 
look dramatically she she probably had to do it but she could there was a third choice she just could have arrested him right nobody had to die right that was, there was a third choice and they never really kind of brought that up in the moment but dramatically we understand all right we're gonna have to skip ahead of some stuff because we're we don't have so much daylight so we know what happened at the end you know the ending was let's say uh generally panned or considered disappointed which brings us 10 about 10 years later <laughs> and we got a new shot at this in, in new blood right dexter's in a new town with a new big bad so and just as a quick interlude for the folks who came in a little bit late if you have any comments or questions put them in the chat box we'll take some at the end um so what did you think of this new version of dexter and i'm talking about the character and and the show with a whole new set of supporting characters, a new setting, and a much pulpier feel to it than the original run. What, 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 did, what did you think, Dharma? I liked it, at least uh, most of it. I wasn't too thrilled about the ending because it felt like the same ending all over again. <laughs> but I, I liked it. I liked the new characters. I liked the small town aspect of it as opposed to the big metropolis of Miami. So yeah, I, I really liked it. I liked the romantic relationship between him and the sheriff. So my one of my favorite moments is when we got to see Dexter beat Dexter a little bit again. He was reenacting mm -hmm. how Harrison had lied about it. He goes, and he's like, no, this they say this don't add up. And we kind of got to see him be a blood spatter guy again. He mm -hmm. was reenacting it. it, was kind of cool. But the theme of the season, Going all the way back to the beginning, the theme of the season was fathers and sons. Mm -hmm. So, Tom, talk to me about Dexter and this version of Harrison. So, I I do love thematically what they tried to do in New Blood. I didn't think they pulled it off, but I did enjoy the father-son aspect of it because I think obviously him going 10 years without a kill he realized harry was the monster harry programmed him to be what he was because clearly he could be he could go without killing he could do it and he did it. he did it and what i didn't like about new blood was how he kept flipping back and forth between i have to teach him the code no the code is bad i should teach him the code he's going to be just like me and there was never like a decisive path that he took and how he wanted to handle Harrison. That's interesting. I actually, I had the opposite view of it. I thought that was the way to go. Because, really? Okay. Yeah, and the reason I thought that is he was 10 years out of practice. He was, I and mean, we saw it, right? He made all, he said, I'm making all sorts of mistakes. He had left all this evidence lying around that he never would have done. I mean, I don't care how good you are at anything. You know, you can lose your skill set in days. He didn't do it for a decade. And he was sort of like rekindling this old life. He was sort of, I think he was torn between his old life and his new life. And Harrison showing up, probably, probably never thought he'd see him again. I think he was trying to unpack a lot in a short time. So the fact that he was flip-flopping, because by the end, right, he'd finally decided, you know, I'm back. And I'm yep. ready to be me again. He didn't, that didn't happen day one. He was trying to sort of figure it out. So Nancy, what about you? Fathers, sons, what do you think? Um, well, the, the problem I have with talking about it now is that I absolutely detested the last episode. I hated it. I didn't just dislike it. I hated it. Wow. I hated it. Hated it. I would have much rather seen the rest, just had them stop at the season eight ending. Um season so the, the yeah. ending we had um i what i wish they'd done is not shown him surviving driving into the storm riding in his boat into the storm i wish they'd stopped there would have been fine but this the ending was idiotic and stupid and i hated it and i and this okay you have to kill me whacked this totally whacked don't understand it don't like it and and so it's it, I feel so strongly about it that everything else that went before is like a domino effect. They never told that boy's parents, you, your kid didn't stab the other guy. That kid's going to be screwed up for life. I mean, there were so many things that they did wrong. And I read a Den of Geek, um, Den of Geek review. Huh. And they huh. said, 
in essence, this guy was happy that we were all sort of being punished for having liked Dexter to say, see all the bad things that he did, that, that he's not a good person. And you guys were wrong for liking him in the first, you know, the pre new blood. And I, and it, and it, no, no, I didn't like new blood. I liked parts of it, but I, as, as a thing, I thought it was a failure. All right, so, fair enough. That was great. But now it's time for a special segment on the show where we spin the wheel on the wheel or seven possible categories. Wherever it lands, it's what you get. And the categories are CSI, Love Me Tender, Dinner is Served, Judge, Jury, and Dexecutioner, Secret Superstitious, Kick Him in the Junk, and Surprise Motherfucker. All right. <laughs> so, all right, Dharma, you're up first. You ready? Okay. All right. Wherever it lands, you can. What do we got for you? And we got, all right, Secret Superstitious. This is one of our okay. newer, newer categories on the show. So what do we got? Even the most strident naysayers will admit in private that they have at least one superstition. What's yours? Oh, superstition. I don't know. Um, I, I can't think of it. I'm not a very superstitious person. I'm very practical, very rational. So, um, I mean, aside from my uh, paranoia of spiders. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we'll 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 count it. All right, you ready? Okay. All right, Tom, you're up next. You ready? All right. All right. What do we got for you? For you, we got oh, okay. It's judge, jury, and executioner. All right. So, our favorite serial killer, Dexter Morgan, just returned for New Blood, and it seemed right. It looked like we were going to get a whole lot more. That said, in reality. If there was a serial killer who only targeted the worst violent criminals on earth and there was no collateral damage to anyone else, would you be okay with a guy like Dexter killing them on his table and disposing of the bodies? Dexter, as he say, taking out the trash. Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All it's right. An easy, easy question. E easy answer. All right. Fair enough. Okay. Hack them up. That's right. Looks like Tom's going to take a run to Costco and get himself some garbage bag. <laughs> <and play. laughs> All right. All right, Nancy, you're next. All right. What do we got for you? All right. And we got surprise motherfucker. <laughs> hey, motherfucker hit me. All what? right. So if you could have any seen any character who got knocked off in Dexter come back for a surprise in a dream or flashback, who would have been? Ooh. Oh. Um, Jordan Chase. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, because I like Johnny Lee Miller. Okay. <laughs> All right, interesting. I actually did not like him in this, but okay. I, didn't, I didn't like him in it, but he's still Johnny Lee Miller. All right, fair enough. All right, okay. Now it's time where we're going to pick your poison. I've got five choices for you a b c d or e i'm not going to tell you what's behind each one but they're all kind of related to our theme tonight so nancy you're up first a b c d or e just pick one e. what is e. that b is e. in b e is, is in excellent oh e is an excellent all right so we're going to find out if you got thick skin oh <laughs> so as writers when we put our work and our our work and ourselves out there, criticism of all kinds comes with it, the good, the bad, and everything in between. How do you feel about reviews and criticism? Do you take them to heart? Do you let them roll off you? Or do some stick with you more than others? Um, I used to read them and they would crush me if they were bad. And now I try to avoid them all the way. I just avoid reading reviews, especially if the reviews about Buffy or a character I did not create. All right, fair enough. Okay, Dharma, you're, you got A, B, C, or D. Let's go with C. All right, Turn. so we're gonna to go to our advice column. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so what's the best and worst writing advice you ever got? Uh, um, I think the, the let's see, the, the best writing advice is uh, trust your process. Hmm. So um, whatever that process may be. Uh, the worst writing advice was, um, I'd say about um, adverbs, um, you know, some people think that adverbs are the worst thing in the world. And really all they are is, you know, uh, the problem isn't the adverbs. The problem is the a weak noun and verb. So if your your nouns and verbs are strong and powerful, you don't need as many adverbs in the first place, but sometimes you just need an occasional adverb. All right, fair enough. All right, Tom, you got A, B or D. Uh, let's go with A. All right. so. 
All right, what do we got here? So A is going to be, we're gonna give you some truth serum. You got 10 Dexter based questions, you ready? Okay, oh. Cuban sandwich or steaks and beer? Steaks and beer. The Guertas jewelry or Angel's hat? Oh, the hat. <laughs> Favorite kill? Oh man. I I have to pass. I can't I can't come up with one <laughs> off the top of my head that quick. Blame, blame. I know. Favorite favorite Dexter Big Bad, and you can't pick Trinity. Oh. Oh. Uh, this is not going to be a popular opinion, but um, the new blood villain. Mm. Kurt. Kurt. I liked him, Kurt, too. Yeah, I mean. I liked him, too. All right. Lundy or Dokes? <laughs> oh, that's impossible. Oh, man. Hey, uh, that's your I got to go with Lundy. I, I like Lundy. <laughs> All right. All right. Masuka or Quinn? Oh, Masuka. Oh, yeah. Greatest character on the show. Yes. <laughs> Lila or Lumen? Oh, Lumen. Oh. I couldn't wait to see Lila die. Right. <laughs> now, she was crazy. All yes. right. Dexter renames his boat. What's the new name? Ooh. Ooh. Ah, man, this is really uh, putting me on the spot here. I, uh, <laughs> someone help me out. Someone jump in. Cut Be above. Clever. Okay, <laughs> cut above. I like it. All right. Nice. All right. Garbage bags or M99? Oh, I'm 99. Give me some right. of that. All right. All right. If you could pick any character from Dexter you wish had gotten a bigger or juicier story arc, who would that have been? Uh, I actually am going to go with Dokes. I would have loved to, to learn more about Dokes' past and see what he could have done if he stuck around longer. All right. So we're going to take some questions. We don't have any in the chat box. So we're going we're gonna to tackle one or two that we didn't get to earlier on. So bear with me. There was a whole bunch of stuff I wanted to talk about. Hold on. Let me. What do we got here? So um let's see what didn't we talk oh can we talk about one thing before yeah, i'm sorry please. to interrupt you no go can we talk about the disappearing bullet in new blood when dexter gets shot in the thigh he's using the the wound to cause a trail of blood so the guys follow him and then it's completely oh. forgotten about the rest of the season oh i <laughs> Well, I took it that it was a flesh wound, not that it was in him. I uh, was squirting out there pretty good when he was making his <laughs> his blood trail. I don't know. I thought that was a huge gaping hole. All right, fair, fair enough. Pun intended. Okay. Fun, Tom. It was just the only gaping hole of new it's, blood. Yeah, that was the only one I noticed. All right, so <laughs> hold on. One, one thing I did want to talk about. I want to talk a little bit more about Deb. So in my mind, she was the true unsung hero of the entire series. Because without Deb and Jennifer Carpenter's performance, I think, does not get anywhere near the recognition that it deserves. I don't think Dexter would have been as charming or lovable to us without him. And we also saw over sort of so many seasons what his version of love ended up doing to her. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about Deb? I mean, this is she's there was a there's a lot to unpack there. But give me a give me a couple of thoughts about Deb. Uh, Nancy. Well, I, I'm going to jump to the end of um, New Blood, which I, I read about this. In the end, De Deb lets go of Dexter's hand. Yes. The original intention of the of the scriptwriter was that Deb and Dexter would hold hands. I, I heard but that, yeah. She herself, the actress, um, Carpenter, suggested they unfold. So I don't know what that means. I don't know why they chose that. But um, I agree. Without Deb, Deb was like his real life consequence. Um, you know, everybody else came and went. The kids, except for Harrison, um, that everybody in his previous life came and went. But Deb was always there. And I also agree with Den of Geek that said that her characterization as a ghost in New Blood vacillated wildly. That sometimes she was for killing somebody and sometimes she was against it. And she seemed inconsistent to me. So um, I, I was sorry for that. And that's another reason I didn't like New Blood as much as original, the TOS, as we might say. Um, Dharma, so, what do you think? Talk to me about Deb. I, I always loved Deb, not only for her gift of profanity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've watched compilation think. videos of, of yeah. her things. Well, Holy she, bucket, yeah, well, bucket of fuck. And <laughs> yes, her, her storm of fuck. 
Oh God, I love that. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and and I, you know, she she was very much his conscience, um, mm -hmm. and I like the way that um, you know she had a way. You know, there was Harry's code, but she had a way of like anytime he started getting into his own head and stuff, she'd punch him on the arm and say, "What the fuck are you thinking?" Yeah get with the program dude and and i just i just love uh their interaction and their relationship all right great. all right guys so we're running out of time so we, i'm going to share my screen and we got some goodies to share so everyone bear with me for a second and we're gonna get to it all right so Dharma, uh, Dharma what, are, what are we looking at here talk to me that is my uh latest uh book in my uh vigilante series um it was it just came out yesterday murder of crows yeah. and it's basically if you can think of um uh a vigilante uh like death wish meets uh discovery channels uh street outlaws that's this movie all right great where can we get it everywhere awesome. amazon barnes and noble kobo everywhere cool right Some paperback hardback uh ebook great awesome all right tom Talk to me. What do we got? Haven. Haven is my first novel. Won the Bram Stoker Award for Superior Achievement in a First Novel. And it's kind of my love letter to all the books I grew up reading and loving, like It, Summer of Night, Boy's Life. It's a uh, small town kids versus monster vibe. Um, that's it. All right. Very cool. Okay. And then what, what do we got here, Nancy? Um, this is one of several new projects that I'm doing with Alan Phillips, and we're a team now, so that's why I chose this. Um, we're writing a number of Nosferatu stories for different anthologies, and we're writing a lot of Kolchak. So uh, we have two characters, that one that Alan created, one we created together, that are going to be comic books. One's Johnny Fade, and one is Mezzanote, or they call me Midnight, and... Uh, and we're excited about those things, but they haven't come out yet. So we've been writing a lot of short fiction and pulp fiction, and um, we're working very well together. Huh. So that's what that's about. Awesome. Someone just chimed in. So Dexter's boat should be called Blood Vessel. I love it. Ooh, that I, that, that's that's a good answer. All right. That. Good on you. All right, guys. Great books. Everyone, make sure you check out, you check out all these great books. Um, and as for me, all right. I nice want to, I'm, I'm really excited. Thank you. I'm excited to share. This is the fourth book in my Angela Hardwick series, Blunt Force Rising, uh, featuring hard boiled uh, private eye Angela Hardwick. In my mind, Hardwick is part Blade Runner, part Doctor Who, and part Sarah Connor. So, in Blunt Force Rising, and this Darmus is going to tie into you a little, what you were talking about a little bit. So, Hardwick and her partner, uh, Eric Whistler, are providing extra security on um, a galaxy cruise ship, which you can see right here. Um, for an AI robotics and cybernetics conference, but that event quickly devolves into a bitter argument between the pro-Android and anti-Android community. And for me, androids in this book are a surrogate for any marginalized group, um, whether it's transgender community or others, who seem to engender all sorts of hate from people who can't rationally articulate where the hate even comes from, or why it affects them so deliriously. Anyway, a murder takes place on board the cruise ship, setting off a chain of events that's just, uh, that's really kind of more horrific than Hardwick has ever seen. Um, and I can tell this for anyone who's either interested in the series, read the series, this is not even close. This is my, this is the bloodiest, goriest book in the series by an extreme margin. So, since we're talking about bloody things tonight, this is definitely a bloody book. It's also a locked room mystery thriller. So if you want some uh, close quarters mayhem, which has not only the gore, but some real philosophical discussions about who has rights, who doesn't, and why, then this one's for you. Uh, so Blunt Force Rising, it's available in paperback and ebook. And in the meantime, I'll encourage you to check out the first three books in the series. And I want to be clear, um, each novel is a standalone. So okay. you can start anywhere. It doesn't matter. I reintroduce the characters and the world building in every book. So plot wise, you can start anywhere in the series, but there is some character development throughout. So your mileage, mileage may vary. It's available on Amazon and published by Crazy 8 Press. Okay, folks, that is our show. I want to thank our my guests tonight, 
Nancy and Tom and Dharma for coming on and getting getting bloody and talking about Dexter. And I want to thank everyone who's watching at home. I hope you had a great time. And if you haven't already, be sure to follow me on social media and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And if you want to see me live, I will be attending Monster Mania this weekend, October 13th through 15th. And what will be my final appearance at Hunt Valley, Maryland, because they're tearing it down in two weeks. All right. I'm your host, Russ Colchamiro. As always, be kind, be gentle, be generous of spirit, and I'll see you all next week. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. That's it. Thanks a lot, guys. I hope you had a good time. Bye now.